Awesome. So hello, everybody. First, I want to wish everyone a very happy Pride Month. Uh, today, I'm going to go over the past, present, and future of responsive design. So who am I? I'm Emily. I am a director for the Cincinnati chapter of Women Who Code. And I'm also the UX designer for LC Vista. I've been designing and developing professionally for 11 years. I love photography, gaming, and hiking. Um, I used to have other hobbies, but because of COVID, I've had to limit them. But I'm slowly getting back into brunch. So I'm looking forward to that. And I will briefly go over the past and current benefits of responsive design, the definition of responsive design, and the current fundamentals and future features, as well as implementation. So at the end of this talk, you should have an understanding of fluid grids, images, and also things like media queries and breakpoints. Let me get rid of this. There we go. Now we can see it better. Okay, so have you ever used your phone to order something and their website wasn't mobile compatible? Yeah, it's tiny text. You're unable to Zoom. Uh, a restaurant that only has a PDF menu and you have to angrily pan around to see everything or have been taken to a mobile version of a website that looked nothing like the desktop version. Everyone has been inconvenienced by websites and web apps ignoring responsive design. So you might be wondering, why isn't the web responsive by default? When the web first started, it wasn't really designed for ordering pizza or watching a movie. It was created for reading documents or hypertext. And then came style sheets, and we were able to adapt it to fit our needs over time. And when mobile phones came out, there, were, there was no guarantee that you were able to view a website. It was a gamble. And once mobile started to gain popularity, companies started to adjust the way their websites and apps handled mobile devices. In the past, that, that really meant creating your own grids with floats, percentages, and negative margins, absolutely positioning a lot of items. And that also meant you had to hide or display none all of the elements you didn't want to show on mobile instead of just adjusting them. Luckily, modern responsive design has come a long way and we can easily create beautiful apps without the need for these workarounds. And this brings us to the benefits of responsive design and why it's important. So why learn it? If you're an aspiring front-end developer, knowing responsive design is almost always a job requirement. If you're building web apps, the majority of the time, they won't have a native mobile app. So you will have to create, create it and make it work on all devices. The job post, job posting here is just one of a thousand just like this, whether it's for a SaaS company or a company with just a lot of internal applications or even just a website, everything needs to be responsive. And why do they need to be responsive? Well, for one, everything needs to be accessible from everywhere because the majority of traffic comes from mobile. And applications that aren't rendered on mobile devices will have massive accessibility problems. Some of the most common issues are text that's too small, buttons and form fields that can't be pressed or tabbed correctly, and incorrect contrast on text so you can't even read it. Uh, but knowing beyond that, knowing how to properly scale an application means that it'll be accessible to all users. And responsive design is just one tool that you can use to solve these issues. It's important that everyone, including people with disabilities, have access to the same resources. And if your application isn't responsive, it's not accessible. And I stand by that. So what is responsive design? In generic terms, it's applications and websites that respond to their environment. We accomplish that by using many things such as grids, flexible images, and media queries. What is adaptive design? Well, certain companies still use something called adaptive design. 
It takes some concepts of responsive, but it doesn't account for all of the current and future resolutions. And with this, design teams provide absolute pixel requirements for layout and for their elements that do not respond according, accordingly. And so the problem with this is that it only considers those few resolutions and nothing in between. And I know some companies still use this around here, but for the most part, they're mostly internal applications. And the difference between responsive and adaptive is that the responsive design, it adapts the rendering of a single page version. In contrast, the adaptive version delivers multiple versions of the same page. And so with adaptive, you're left with pages that break and they don't adjust until they reach the next breakpoint, as you can see here. And what about common resolutions? I'm sure people have heard that in their, no matter where you work, but having static designs was common about 10 years ago, and that was a carryover from print. But now there's no, there's no standard width in this day and age because due to the, the wide variety of devices. And we have to consider that mobile users might use landscape and desktop might have might not have their window maximized and may have tons of windows open at the same time. So it could really be anything. And it's not designing and developing to fit all resolutions. Screen sizes are always changing. So it's important that your web app can adapt to any screen size today in the future. So it it's, it's, encompasses everything. And this is called future proofing and a lot of developers do that. Now let's go over the building blocks of responsive design. So I'll go over the common terminology so everyone has a better understanding when we get into the implementation section. The first one, relative units. A relative unit gets its sizing from either a parent, a root element, or the size of the viewport. And relative units like the M or the root M unit give us adaptability and flexibility to scale more efficiently. Fluid grids. The grid is an element with areas in columns and rows, and it could be set to auto fit or adjust across different breakpoints. Uh, flexible images. Now I'm really saying flexible images just so I can avoid saying the, the word responsive a thousand times in this, <laughs> in this uh, demo, but uh, here I'll call it flexible images, but it is also known as responsive images. And these are just images that can be served to the browser in different sizes, depending on the image size and resolution. And ensuring images are responsive will avoid having pixelated to small images or images that are unnecessarily large and slow down site loading. I'm sure you've seen that as well. Breakpoints, these are points in screen sized informed by media queries where a website or web app adjusts its layout. And you can set breakpoints to be whatever makes the most sense for your application. Again, not on device, but for what makes sense. And media queries. It's a, it's a CSS function that receives information about size from the viewer's device to trigger these breakpoints. And the last one is mobile first. This is mainly used in design as a design strategy of designing the mobile design first before designing for larger devices. This is to push designers to prioritize smaller, more accessible mobile designs. And you'll hear this more in design or the developers responsible for more of the front of the front end because it's easier to start small. And before I get into the main implementation, I wanna take time to showcase some helpful CSS that will make your life easier. And without this, creating grids or really anything would be difficult. So this is the box model. In general terms, this is essentially a box that wraps around every HTML element. It contains margins, padding, borders, and the content itself. And by setting it to border box, you're telling the browser to account for any padding it border to the elements width and height. And you would add this to uh, the top of your style sheet, your root style sheet. And you can't really do responsive design without this. You can really, 
uh, and I did prior, but you have to manually calculate a lot of the margin padding and border of every element. Otherwise it will break on your page. Uh, so now you can see why if you don't add this, you're in for a lot of additional work. But good news is if you're already using a CSS framework, uh, it's already often included, so you won't need to do anything here. But I would also just double check. Now for the current. As for the implementation, there is no right way to do, to do things. There are common ways to do things, and everyone has their favorite way. My view on it is that as long as it's supported by the browsers you need to support and humans can read it, you're good to go. So again, relative units. And I'm going to show you the pixel versions for clarity. This is the M unit. And it's an older unit of measure that came that kind of came from print. It's uh, a unit that allows setting the font size of a, an element relative to the font size of its parent. And for other properties, it'll be relative to the font size of its current element. So here you have, I have two classes, one parent and one child. And this would make the child 24 pixels because the parent is set at 16 and 1.5 multiplied by 16 is 24. This one is my preferred method because it's easier. This was released after the M unit and this is the root M unit, which is fun to say. Uh, it's based on the font size of the HTML element and the default HTML element font size is 16. So this means that the parent elements are ignored and only the root value is considered. So if you see here on the HTML, it's set at 16 as it should be. And the parent is set at 14 and the child is two. That would make it 32 pixels since we are ignoring the parent like I did as a teenager. So another relative unit is VH and VW. And that stands for viewpoint. Uh, viewport width and height. So basically one VW or viewport width is equal to 1% of the viewport's width and one VH is 1% of the viewport's height. And here I have uh, just semantic HTML, a nav element and a main element. And I set that to 5% of the viewport height and 75% of the viewport's width. And that's what it would look like based on those calculations. So fluid grids, what you came here to see probably. For years, the only tools available for creating CSS layouts were custom grids that used floats and positioning. Now, modern layout methods are responsive by default with Flexbox and CSS grid. And the main reason it took so long to adopt modern grids is mainly due to businesses needing to support IE and Edge. Once that went away, companies could use these newer methods. And if you haven't heard of caniuse.com, it's incredibly useful. You can check the support of front end features against different browsers. So definitely check that out. So I'm gonna go over Flexbox first. This is the method I go to and I have the most experience with, uh, mainly because Bootstrap Grid started to use Flexbox and they have wonderful examples and documentation to help you learn this method. And you can actually use Bootstrap's grid without using their entire framework. So in short, Flexbox is a set module of a number of properties that define parent and child items. These flex items will shrink or expand to distribute the space. And now each layout method could have their own tech talk. So I'm going to do my best to explain the basics. I'm gonna go over the most important properties of Flexbox that I use every day, but there are a ton of functions and properties out there that you might find useful. So here you have the row is the flex container and the flex items you see are one, two, three. And the row class is defined as display flex and it is a row that wraps the item is set to flex of one, which will space the container will all of will be distributed equally in the container. So if you added another one, it would just keep the same space. Now this is a, a great attribute here the justify content. So using the row and setting justify content to flex start 
everything will go to the left. And this is on the x axis. And you see that bottom example that uses center value. And you see how the items are neatly centered. You just learned how to center a div. Congratulations. Rockstar dev. OK, now we're on to align content. <laughs> align content is another attribute uh, that, I, that I use all the time. And that is for the y-axis. So with flex start, it pushes everything to the top. And with center, everything is centered uh, vertically and horizontally in this one. And now we're going to move on to CSS Grid. Uh, Grid was adopted by, the, by most browsers in 2017, even though it was released in 07. It was designed to work with other parts of CSS. Grid was designed for a two-dimensional layout instead of one like Flexbox. It uses containers or rows and columns, which could be in any order. And just like with Flexbox, you can create rows and columns. The main difference here between Flexbox and, and Grid is that with Flexbox, the container contains the direction while the sizing is placed on the item. But with CSS Grid, you do most of the sizing on the container or row. And now we'll get into different terminology and properties. A track. A track is essentially the space between any two lines on the grid. And the box below is an example of a track. Tracks are like columns, and they can be defined by any unit of, of length. And CSS Grid introduced a, another length unit to help create these tracks. And that is the FR, or fraction unit, represents a fraction of the space in the container. By adding these three fractions to the row, we're dividing the row into three equal tracks. And the items you see would expand and shrink with the available space. And I have example in that class below. We're setting it to grid, the cap of 20, and the columns are three fractions. Now, another fun one is the min-max function. To set up an explicit grid, you might want to set a minimum track size. And you can do this with a minimum fun min-max function. In this example, I don't want any of my rows to be smaller than 200 pixels. But if I have too much content and it stretches beyond that, I want to expand it span everything to that height. So by putting min max in grid auto rows, it creates rows with a minimum height of 200 pixels. By using auto, that means it will stretch to the tallest item in the row, as you can see. And again, there are tons of ways to handle grids. And if you want to learn all of the properties and functions, I suggest pulling up CSS Tricks Complete Guide to Grid. That's a great article. Uh, and CSS Tricks is great if you haven't checked that out. I fell in love with it at the start of my career 11 years ago, and I still love it to this day. It's, they come up with great stuff. So now we're going to move on to images were a little bit more complicated. There are many ways you can handle images, but in short, you can do it with the image element or the picture element. For images, and instead of labeling them with a pixel density X, you go with their resource width using W descriptors. So if the cat small JPEG is 200 pixels wide, we, we label it as 200 W. The size attribute specifies different image widths, which are tied to the browser. And here I came up with a better example for the, for the sizes. So a max width of 599, you're going to use the 200. And then you know 1,199, 600, and so forth. So each image has it breaks at a different size. And this is great if you want to keep uh, image loading down so you're not bombarding the, the user with a lot of data. And here's an example of picture element. I love using picture elements because it's it's great if you need to worry about art direction. So if you're not familiar with art direction, I could give you a summary of that later. But for picture elements, it uses media, which is similar to a media query. In this example, it has two different versions. And you need a backup image element 
with pictures to be backwards compatible. So you have two different images here, one with that's zoomed out and the min width is 1200 pixels and then a standard one that is 600. Okay. There are many ways to handle media queries. Some put all of their attributes that are adjusted within the media query, which is something that I like to do, leaving only the static attributes in the base CSS file. Or some people use media queries only as overrides. You do you. For the one on the left, that is actually what a media query looks like. And on the right, that is the breakpoint. So that's where it'll break in your layout. And I will show you more of that in the code example later. So please, setting a default text size of 12 pixels or 11 pixels is no longer cool. Was it ever cool? Probably not, but we're not gonna do it now. What should we do instead? Well, for desktop, and I'm gonna use root ends here, for body size, uh, 16 is fine. It's already set as the default on the HTML element, so it's perfectly fine. Um, headers, the H1 could be about 2.5 or 40 pixels or less. Uh, other headers will be smaller to 1.5, 1.2. It's all your choice. And functional text can be reduced to, to 14 pixels. Kind of 12 at the, the very, very smallest. For mobile, I would keep the body size the same. 16 is, is also good for mobile. Uh, decrease your header sizes because their chances are they're going to be way too big for your content. Uh, you'll have to play around with what looks good for your app. And one of the major challenges is to make sure that all text is legible on all devices and resolutions. But if you start with a good foundation, you can scale accordingly using relative units. And headers don't have to be a certain size, I want to reiterate, but they should create a, a nice visual hierarchy. And there are a couple ways to handle this for topography. Most of the time, when we think of responsive topography, we think of font sizes that change size based upon breakpoints that we set. Designers provide acceptable font sizes based upon the devices. And the text might look fine on the, on the designs, but they end up breaking in between breakpoints that we didn't define. So here you have the responsive way where it will break the header according to 300 and 768 pixels. But using a fluid method that scales accordingly, it scales smoothly between minimum and maximum values. The example shown here uses the clamp function. This reduces the need to manually adjust each header and block off text in the application with breakpoints. So you can see the clamp function takes a minimum value against a maximum value. So it, it will go in between those two sizes. And it's great. And I'll show you an example of that in the code. So the fluid method. There are limitations to using fluid values like this that I want to point out. It's not a catch-all for every problem because it doesn't address every accessibility issues you, you might come across. Uh, there is a chance that users might not be able to scale text beyond 200%. But with that said, it is an, even though it's not a magical fix, you can get around these limitations with JavaScript. And I, I still highly recommend using Clamp for all of your designs. So I wanted to touch upon some future implementation that people may not be aware of. A few new features are being talked about and have been released on Safari, at least in their development mode. It's important to note that these aren't widely supported by, by anyone, but it's nice to keep an eye on what's coming down the pipe. So one that I am the most excited about and I think will be the most important is the idea of container queries. And the container query is similar to media queries, but it only pertains to the size of the container. So this will allow you to change the layout or styling based on the size of an item and not the viewport. So the container type defines an item as a query container and descendants can query aspects of its sizing. And the container name defines the query container. 
So it could use the rules and filter which query containers are targeted. And it also introduces a bunch of new units of measure that cover the containers with height and different sizes. And so basically it introduces a lot more logic into CSS so we can rely on JavaScript less for conditional styling. So here, here's an example. We have a class of container that's set to inline size. So it has a container type and the container name is left card. And we have a class that has just the main content. It's a flex and has a row with a gap of 20 pixels. So using this, like a media query, if it, the width is above 300 pixels, then the row is reversed. And you can do this with a, a number of different ways, but this is, this is a way to really target that one piece, that one element, that one card that may be larger than everything else. So you don't have to change the whole page. So before I get into the code, I wanted to take a second to go over why I chose to make a frog app because I've gotten this question from quite a few people. Okay, so number one, frogs are awesome. And number two, everybody wants to showcase something productive like a to-do list or a shopping cart. And I wanted to do something fun because that's why I started coding as a kid in the first place, not to make corporations a bunch of money. So if you're trying to learn something new, it's, it's actually easier to learn if it's something that brings you joy. Building a shopping cart is far less fun than building an app full of your favorite animals. Chances are, if, you're, if you start with something you love, you'll actually end up finishing it like I did. Not everything we create needs to be useful. Not everything needs to be about money and being productive. Um, I think life needs a little bit more fun and a little bit less work. So with that, let's take a look at some code. So what you have here is, am I still sharing on the screen? I think so. Could, could yep, everybody you are. See? Cool. It's not seeing the green button or anyway. Well, this is responsive frogs. So this is an Angular app. This also uses Angular material. It has a number of different pages that feature different responsive design examples. So I'm gonna go over the first one, the obvious one, the, the, the frog cards. So it's essentially a list of cards that contain a bunch of frog information. If you click the button, it'll take you to the Wikipedia page, which is highly important. And you can also filter the frogs by region, which is also highly important. So this uses Flexbox. And if we open up the developer tools, I can show you how it works. So I set the row to wrap. The gap is 30 pixels. The columns themselves, I set the width to 31 because I wanted, I wanted instead of using the image element size, I wanted to set it to adjust. And I will show you what I mean. If I set it to 800, it wouldn't adjust accordingly. So by having 31%, I can have three cards in a row. And it breaks to two, and then it breaks to one, which is what I want. The image itself, the frog, does have multiple versions to different sizes. And it's set to be 100% of that container which is why it adjusts accordingly when I adjust the viewport. Okay, that's it. Let me show you the code here. So the media query for this, it starts out with auto. So that's just the one card. And then at 576 pixels, it goes up to back up to 31% and the containers adjust once it's above a certain point. That way we're not having a minimum container of a thousand pixels, which is not enough. But that is that. So let me go to a different page for you. Let's go over the flex examples. So the first one, the justify center align center 
we went over this, this is what it would look like. So this is centered on the X and Y axis. And as we reduce this, it adjusts everything and it wraps as it should until it gets to one. And for the next one, this is justify start align start. So this pushes everything to the top and to the left. But one thing to notice, I signed a width and height on this. If you don't, if you don't, you won't be, you won't have anything to go off of. So, but normally a card will, have, will automatically have width and height in it. So it's not something you regularly have to worry about. But for this demo, I did. So with this, it does the exact same thing when you minimize it. But I want to show you the last one. And this is the, the cool one. So with justify between, it distributes the space evenly between all the items. And align flex end just pushes everything to the bottom. But when you do that, it will distribute the space evenly until you get to where there's no space at all. So that's that. Let's go back up to the image examples. Now for this example, I did not use an image. I used a uh, picture, the picture element we spoke about earlier. because so I wanted to show you what that would look like. So I, I'm using two different sizes. If the max width is 799 pixels, we're going to use the smaller image. And if it's, a, if it's 800, we're going to use 800. So it does break. And once we reach about 800, I'll show you what I mean. It will turn into a different picture. OK, you see there? That is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about art direction. So if you needed to place a, a better image for a smaller resolution, you would do so with picture element. OK. And the last thing I wanted to show you is typography. OK. So I wanted to show you an example of headers and text using clamp versus media queries. So. Notice that the one on the left, the clamp header, is actually getting smaller and the one on the right isn't. And notice how that's fluid. And that still hasn't changed. And it doesn't change till about a still gone. OK, right there. That's when it breaks. But really, it should have it should have broken sooner. We should have had a different break point. But if you're using clamp, you don't really have to worry about, about that. And that goes along with, with anything. Anything that uses a value, you can use clamp on. It's it's fantastic. It's what previously we were using uh, what's called a calc function to do all of this, but now it does it all all in one function. So let me pull up Visual Studio, and I can show you what those headers look like. So. Down here at 300 min width, you have these two. I put, so they're only breaking twice. So the first H1 with a resize class is set at 1.7 root Ms. And then the maximum is 2.5. But it, it, it never gets anything in between, unlike clamp, what I said at the top. Which, which does vary between these two sizes, according to the viewport width. Uh, what else did I want to show you? I think that's it. I mean, I'll briefly go over the, the Angular bit, um, since I know Stephanie was kind of curious about it. Um, all of my styling is in here. Um, all of my modules are called from just the root module. I'm getting the frogs from a service. So right here, and, and on drop down change, it changes all of the frogs. And this is all of my frog data. 
which I spent way too much time on. But yeah, I think that's it. I don't know if I have anything, anything else. We can go into the question portion. See, I have 22 comments. Open source. <laughs> I might, I might open source that frog data. Um, the a serious question. <laughs> my first question is when is the data available to me? <laughs> but my second follow up serious question um, is from earlier is when do you use fluid over responsive always? I yes. Yes, I, I would use the clamp function fluid uh, over responsive. You, there are still really great ways uh, to utilize media queries um, with typography. Things like if you want to change the font weight or the letter spacing or the line spacing to make it more legible, I feel like those are really great ways that you could change it with media queries. Um, will, oh, sorry. You can go ahead. Uh, the other question um, is, will, are you open to sharing your slides? Yes. Yes, I will happily share all of this. I spent a lot of time. I will upload it to either my, a repo on mine or for the Women Who Codes repo. I know we have that, right? Okay, cool. We can link it if you want to upload it on your own and then we can add you under the events and I'll go find the link and share it here so they know where to look for it later. Yeah, trying to go. <laughs> I'm glad everybody loves the frogs. <laughs> yes, clamp is extremely useful. It's one of those things, just like um, which box sizing. When box sizing first came out, it blew my mind. Clamp had the very similar feel for me. It just it really opened my eyes to easier possibilities. Any resource? I I have one on my phone. I will try to send that in Slack for sure. Um, I'll try to provide that. You know what? I'm going to add it in the slides itself. So then it'll, it'll be included in there. Any other questions? They don't have to be frog or clamp related. I have one. Hi. Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. Oh, no, you can go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. I can go ahead. Okay, I'll, I will go. Um, I had a question about, so I oftentimes building a mobile friendly site, like how do you make the trade off between optimizing, like building basically a different page on mobile where like elements are totally different, different orders, kind of different structure versus responsive design? So your question is, how do I restructure elements better on mobile? Like, I think sometimes in the past, I've gotten designs that the desktop version is almost different elements. Like maybe you'll use a drop down on desktop and you use a completely different element on mobile, just depending on how, how it should function. Maybe some kind of, I don't know, some of the elements aren't as important on mobile, kind of like a mobile optimized site versus responsive. Hmm. I, I try to keep everything the same. I mean, there you can still use drop downs and radio buttons and check boxes on a mobile device. Like I wouldn't change any of that. The only thing I would do in that instance is just make sure um, have one element to align or two, depending on how small it is. And just, I can, I can definitely show you examples I don't know if I have any at the top of my list, um, but but yeah, it's all about restructuring elements and not necessarily hiding elements. The the one thing that's incredibly difficult to do, and I still struggle with this, is tables. And the only yeah. the only real way you can really like tackle that is by changing your table to a card list. So instead of a row 
it would be a small card with all of that information within a row. Yeah, that's probably a better example than like a drop down because yeah, just like a yeah. completely different element that wouldn't work on mobile that just sizing it down doesn't work. And I think it's just interesting to see when the trade offs made to build a totally separate component versus styling it down. Yeah, uh, I feel like tables is one of the one of the only ones that really need to be you need to use a totally different component. It's it's almost impossible. You're just going to do a whole lot of scrolling. <laughs> and maybe calendars, unless you do it right. There are right ways to do it, but it's challenging. So we have any other questions? I feel like I'm yeah, it. hi. Hello. Yeah, so I literally just started um, learning about the whole responsive, um, responsive website and all of that. So I was building my, um, my website and I got to the nav section, but it kept jumping up like, so the logo is aligned and when I introduce a breakpoint, it works, but on the whole website on its own, the, um, the UL kept jumping up, even though I used the justify content uh, center and all of that. So I don't know um, how to fix that. I mean, it's a very simple question, but I'm literally just starting. So I have no idea how to fix it. It's really hard to, to give code advice when I don't have the code in front of me. I'm, if, if, you, if you wanna get on Slack later and, and post your example, I would happily look it over and see. Oh, but it's, that's perfect. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to build it in my head. It's it's not it's not working out. Yeah, I understand. Okay, I, I think I'll I'll share it in the Slack later on after the class. Thanks. I'll happily look at it. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Please, can you suggest a book or learning CSS or framework like Bootstrap? Bootstrap is great. Um, I definitely, a lot of companies still use Bootstrap and that that is a good place to start because it also teaches you things like uh, Flexbox and you get to see how everything works. So I, I do feel like that's a good, good place to start. Also, uh, CSS Tricks. CSS Tricks has guides for almost anything. Like if you're looking for CSS anything, just go there and I'm sure that you could you could definitely find a, a bunch of stuff. I go up. Is it ever not mobile first design? Yes. So some companies still aren't doing responsive. Like if it a lot of them are internal applications and um, it's something that I'm trying to push them to do, but it's not. So in this instances where there, it's an internal application and it doesn't need to be responsive, you wouldn't focus on mobile, you would go straight into the desktop version. But really, even if, as long as you're developing your components in a way that are fluid, it shouldn't really matter that you're not designing mobile first because it should still automatically adjust just like the frogs in the card did. I, I actually didn't do that mobile first. I just pro, I just coded it in a way that would work for every resolution. Hope that helps. Sweet. Any other things? I'm trying to scroll up that I, is there anything that you think I didn't cover? that you wanna learn more about, because I can always redo this at another time. Oh my goodness. Okay, so mm, I really like First Watch for simple, like the one by you, because nobody goes there. I also like wait, Taste of Belgium and Rookwood, because they have the better location, those two. Please recommend some places with responsive fluid templates to buy. I, I think you could use, I mean, Bootstrap 
grids free, you can use that, or you can also, I don't know if you use Angular, you can use Angular Material and they do also have a grid. So you could also use that. Ooh, sugar and spice. I haven't heard of that one. That's a good one. And oh, yeah, I have one final question. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I've interacted with Bootstrap before, but um, it's almost it's very similar to CSS Grid in a way. So is it like if I learn Bootstrap, I won't be using CSS Grid to build my websites? and it would just be Bootstrap and Flexbox, or I'll, I'll combine everything together. So kids, I'm quite confused. Okay, Bootstrap Grid uses Flexbox, unless they changed it in the last however many long, but it sh they should still use Bootstrap or, or Flexbox in their grid. Looks like they just released 5.2. I'm pretty sure they still do, but I would double check. I'm pretty sure it's still Flexbox. So you can technically use Flexbox and Grid. Um, I don't know why, but you, you can, and it's not going to be an issue. And oh, okay. do I like React? Not really. I, I don't, every time I try to get into React, I look at it. And my brain just, it's angry because of, yeah, Tailwind is a good one. But Angular and React are different. Angular still uses, React likes to put all of the CSS and all of the HTML in the component. And that's not how my brain works. I like to separate everything out so I can see the HTML, I can see the CSS, and it's not all one big jumbled mess and that's how how I work so it's hard to go from that mindset to JavaScript first kind of stuff plus I really like TypeScript and I know that you can have workarounds with React to use TypeScript but it's with Angular it's out of the box everything is ready to go and you don't have to do any workarounds yes we did have a tailwind talk with Eric, and that was awesome. Any uh, other? I had a question. Sure. Uh, um, so I was just wondering. Um, I know there's flex block or flex box and grid, but um, do you have like examples where each might be used? Because the fact that both exist, I imagine they're used in different instances, or is there a preference thing? Or it is, it is a preference. I prefer Flexbox. That's why I did the the app in Flexbox. Um, as far as CSS Grid, pull one up. There you go. Hmm. I will put it in the chat. So everybody can grab it. So that is the complete guide to grid. Um, it's oh. it's more two dimensional than than flex flexbox, but I find it's more complicated than I need it to be. I mean, you can do literally anything with it, which is great if you're having really complicated issues. But if you're just looking for a grid that puts stuff in rows. I just work with Flexbox. Okay. But yeah. Um, and they don't have like limitations that where you can't always use grid or you can't always use flex Flexbox rather. No, it's they're at this point, both Flexbox and grid are widely supported with every browser. So all of it um, is good. I do know that okay. one of the future releases for Grid will be introducing um, like grandchildren. So technically the Grid only works with the children, but then it'll, it will work with uh, the grandchildren. So the elements after that, 
which is which is great. So it'll affect more elements, and you won't have to to work around that. But but that's not anytime soon. That's fair. Um, sorry, one last thing. I was just wondering, um, do you plan on doing these future talks again, or the same ones? This, you mean one with responsive design or something yeah. different? Uh, I'm, well, I've spent so much time on it. I'm sure I will do this again somewhere else. I've, I've stuck like 60 hours into this thing. I might as well get some more out of it. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, Women Who Code has this bi-yearly summit, Sierra, I think it is, where they do a call for speakers. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll, yeah. maybe I'll do it there. Yeah. Might as well. Oh. Cool. To do it well, through the front end track um, as well. Yeah. That's cool. Well, thank you. Anytime. Well, is there any other questions that I can answer? They don't have to be responsive design related. It could be anything, actually. <laughs> <laughs>